Hello, I'm Bryony, um, and I'm just here to tell you my story. Um, back in um, 1994, I was working for a literary agency, and um, it was my job to do things like the photocopying and opening the post and making the tea, and going to the post office. And uh, so one day, um, I opened an envelope, and it was a file I'd never seen before. It was a sort of, you open it up, and instead of punching holes in the paper to hold it in the file, it was a sort of clamp file. And I thought, that was interesting. I've never seen one like that. And that led me to look at the three chapters that had been sent in with the covering letter. And I started reading. And I was like, oh, it's a children's book. We don't do those. So I was supposed to put it in the slush pile. But I read the first page, and it made me laugh. So I thought, oh, I'll read the rest of that later. And um, put it to one side to read in my lunch hour. And the reader who was employed to come and read manuscripts in the, in the agency came in that morning. And, um, and she, um, she read it as well. She thought it was funny. And I read the rest of it at lunchtime. And um, I just wanted to know what happened. Um, so I said to the boss, is it right if I send off for it? I had sold one book already, um, an adult novel. And, um, and I was just looking for a few things. I was working with a few authors, but I wasn't really an agent. I was just kind of hoping. And so um, he said, fine, yeah, whatever. And so I sent off for it. And I read it really quickly. Um, it, I couldn't put it down. It was a great detective story. And I got to the end, and they were, oh, I can see the clues all the way through now. But I didn't spot them on, on the way through. And it was a boarding school story. And I was absolutely brought up on Enid Blyton and the school stories and I loved the romance of it. And it was uh, funny. And it was that whole fairy tale of someone being brought up in oh, an evil stepfamily, or oh, well, maybe one day a dream will happen. And of course, that was what it was about. And above all, it was magical. Is there anyone in the room who hasn't read it? <laughs> so we're on, we know we're talking about Harry Potter. And really, I just, li I just liked the story. I didn't, see, I didn't think it was a worldwide bestseller or anything like that. But I liked the story. I wanted to see what I could do with it. And I, so I asked the boss if I could read it. He read it overnight. And he, he gave me a few comments. And uh, between us, we, um, we decided, he decided that there should be more about Quidditch. And of course, as we all know now, J.K. Rowling has yards and yards of notes about everything in the book. She said, oh, yeah, I took those rules out because I thought it was too late. I'll just put them back in. So, and I wanted to know more about Neville because he's very sweet and he's so bumbling and cute and clumsy in the first book. And, and she said, yes, yes, he's one of my favourite characters. Happy to put more about him in. So basically, she sent back the manuscript. It was about this thick. Um, and it was effectively the book almost as it was published. I don't think there was too much um, that changed later. But because I wasn't really an agent and we didn't really do children's books, we had budget. And my job was to photocopy the literary novels that we sent out, and they were this thick, and we'd make 12 copies and send them to all the publishers, and I'd cart them down the post office in a big sack. And Anyway, so I had my three, I was allowed to make three copies. I wasn't allowed to make any more, so I had to send them out, and then I had to wait and wait and wait for them to be rejected or to get comments. So I had to ring them up and say, could you send it back if you're not going to read it? And I waited for them to send it back, and then eventually it went to about 12 publishers, something like that. And... Um, it was with a couple. I had one came, one came back, and I was like, who do I send it to next? And um, we decided uh, between us that we would send it to um, Bloomsbury, uh, who had published another book of ours. And again, we didn't do children's books. We had a few for existing clients on the books already. So we sent it off to Barry Cunningham at Bloomsbury. And he and his uh, colleague in the children's department liked it so much that when they photocopied sets of the manuscripts to take to the commissioning meeting, they actually sellotaped tubes of Smarties on. That's a... Um, sweets and the, the Smarties Prize was the big children's book prize in the UK and they were so convinced it would win that they sent it out to their fellow editors with the promise that it would win the prize and of course as, uh, it went on to win the prize three years in a row and then they stopped entering it after that to let someone else have a chance so, um, so they liked it, they made an offer it was very small and um, there's the story about how um, when Christopher, the, the agent, took uh, Joanne Rowling to lunch with her editor for the first time, he said, you won't make any money. Don't expect to make any money out of this. And she was just so delighted to have it published that it was great. Anyway, we did the deal, and then shortly after that, I left the agency. But I kept my ear to the ground because I wanted to know that the right thing had happened for this book because it was, it was close. It was personal to me. I, it was only the second book I'd sold. So I kept my ear to the ground, and then I started to hear a buzz. There was sort of word going on about it. I kept hearing about it. I read in the newspaper, in the London Evening Standard, a very small piece about a lawyer who had gone to a case in 
I think Dursley, when they should have been at a case 40 miles away in Dudley. So I wrote a letter to the paper saying, perhaps the lawyer had been reading her children this marvellous children's book called Harry Potter, and, and there's a character called Dudley Dursley, and they published my letter, uh, which amused me. And uh, I, I keep publicising it, even though I'm not working there anymore. Turn it round in bookshops, that sort of thing. And um, <laughs> so... <laughs> And then the, the, the news broke of the big um, sale of the film rights and the American deal for the book, and it started to take off. And my aunt heard um, that Joanne Rowling was coming to speak at the Cheltenham Literary Festival, and she knew about my involvement, so she borrowed two children, and we went and got tickets. And, uh, and, um, and as a thank you, I bought her the um, first adult cover edition, um, because that had just come out that week, so I gave my aunt the paperback as a present. So we went off and we, we sat in a room, Joanne came in and did a reading to the children, there were th hundreds of children, well, a lot of children, about 50 children I think, sitting there, they all clutching their copy of Chamber of Secrets, and they knew everything about both the books. They, they, it had just come out and they devoured it. And they were asked, uh, well, she did a reading about Dobby, and they, they were, all the children were asking these amazing questions. They really in depth knowledge of the first two books, proper fans. And she was answering them, she was engaging with them, and she was telling them all sorts of interesting things about. There was, one of them said, Where do you get the names from? And she said, Well, I actually hear an interesting name and I store it up. Um, I think she said that Flitwick is a little village on the M1 near Milton Keynes and Dumbledore's the old English for Bumblebee, things like that. And I was brave and put my hand up and I was the first adult to ask a question. So she was pleased to hear from an adult, not just children. Um, I think she's starting to realise that her audience was quite wide at that point. And then we went backstage to the, well, to the signing tent and we queued up and she signed my aunt's copy and it was actually the first one she'd ever signed to the adult edition, so my aunt was very pleased. And, uh, and then I gave her a photocopy that I'd brought her, this letter and the little article about Dudley Dursley and showed it to her and, and she, she realised who I was and jumped up and gave me a big hug in front of everyone and said that I was the most important person she'd met in the signing queue, which was lovely. So I got a great big hug. And... Um, so, yeah, and then obviously, as we all know, it got bigger and bigger after that, and um, my boss, I, I changed jobs, and my boss snitched on me, and because his friend at the Times, and the, the Times published an article about me, and then that led to um, other people being interested. Um, and, of course, I just told my story as it happened, and then I got contacted by another journalist um, who asked me the story, so I told him the same story, because that was the truth, and... And then his newspaper, it was a very down market UK newspaper, a tabloid, and they published a piece about the reader who'd read it that first day as well, saying that she had discovered everything, which was, yeah, that's the way the UK press works. So um, there was, it, was, but it was also interesting because um, I, I then, um, shortly after that, met J.K. Rowling at another signing. I was given, very lucky to be given a ticket. And um, she, she wrote, wrote a lot in my book, and I, I didn't quite see what she was reading. And it was, of course, it was Goblet of Fire that had come out. It was the first appearances of Rita Skeeter, the poison pen journalist who, um, as J.K. Rowling, was obviously having some run-ins with the press. And when I um, went away from the signing and saw what she'd written, she said, for Bryony, who really did discover Harry Potter. And it was like, ah, oh, OK, so she knows what my stories, which was very nice. that We knew each other's stories. I was really pleased. Um, so... Um, I, yeah, I saw all the films, and I, 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 I've, I've read all the books. I have only read book seven once. I need to read it again. I'm kind of sort of saving it because it's kind of special. Um, I have sort of devoured it to find out what happened, but I need to read it again in more depth. It's kind of, if I've read them all, then I've got nothing else left to read, so, um, so I need to give it some more attention. And, um, and I saw the films, and I got to the end, and I had a little cry. I went with my friend. She took me to see it, and I had a little cry at the end because it had been like a sort of 16, 17-year association from first reading the book to when the last film came out. And, um, and everyone says to me, did you make any money? And I said, well, I didn't. I left the agency before, um, before anything happened, so I don't... It doesn't feel like I need anything, but I get these little treats, like speaking to the, um, the Times and having my photo taken for People magazine or coming over to see Oprah. I'm talking to you all here today. And, um, and I think also the thing that really works for me is when I meet people who read the books and I'm meeting a lot of younger people who grew up with the books now. Of course, we had to wait and wait for each one to be published, but there's people now who come up and my goddaughter's read them all and, and Siri that I work with. And she's, she was, oh my God, those books changed my life. And I was contacted by uh, an Argentinian fan who just uh, contacted me online and said, would you go and meet J.K. Rowling 
and get my book signed for me, and, and I did that. And she remembered him. When I, I was, he told me what to say so that she would remember. And I, I just told her his name, and he oh, no, I know him. And she was just, just really engaged with the fans. It's absolutely lovely how, um, how she remembers people and how she met them, what their stories are. But there is one final thing um, when people say, did you get anything? Well, I didn't expect anything at all. And then you may all have heard that um, she published a detective novel, because as we all know from the first Harry Potter, she's really good at writing detective stories. So she's just, uh, written under the pseudonym of Robert Galbraith. And it wasn't meant to come out, but it did. And of course, I went out and got a copy straight away and read it. And as I was reading, the character is in an office and she's going through the drawer of the desk and she finds an unusual filing clip. It's like, ah, this resonates back to the very beginning of how I originally made the manuscript. And I was like, oh, oh that's so lovely. And I was like, oh, that's, that's as much validation I need a secret message in a book that's by an author that nobody's supposed to know and that it's her. And then I carried on reading and I got halfway through and there was a character called Bryony. So, <laughs> so yeah, I just think that that's... Um, it's just been an absolute pleasure to, to read the story, to be part of the story. It's such a huge story. It's not my story, but I've got a very small part in it. So I have my own story, and that's really lovely. And I think what I've learned about sort of the, the, the message for you all here at Chicago Ideas Week, it's about it doesn't matter what your idea is or what you see in something. I didn't think it was I was discovering a worldwide bestseller. What I was, what I was thinking of is this is a book that I really want to read. This is a book that I want other people to read. I think that this is a really good book. I really like reading it. It made me laugh. It made me feel what I felt like when I was reading books as a child. And I just believed in it, in that it needed to be heard by more people. It needed to have more. And I just say that if anyone has any ideas about anything, if you believe in it, go for it. If it makes you happy, that's your starting point. And whether you fail or carry on, that's fine. If it makes you happy, do it. Thank you.